some videos are hard to do because the topic is not one I am as intimately familiar with as, as others. Some videos are hard to do because of the opposite. Every time I've ever seen a great academic completely flub up a lecture, it's been on their research topic. Now let me explain that. Because you'd think, if it's their area of personal research, if it's their area of passionate research which they're working on, surely it's going to be their area of strongest knowledge. It is. It is definitely their area of strongest knowledge. But that's also the area which they have spent the most time dwelling in, where they've developed their closest affinity for it and have probably developed their own shorthand. It's kind of like when you get a professional racing driver and you ask them to explain driving to you. The vast majority of them, the vast majority of them, will want to show you, not tell you. Because for them, Driving is like breathing. It's become an extension of them as their self. And it's the same when you get into a research topic which is an extension of you. As an academic or anything, you know, in any of our lives where we are really, really good. We have spent a lot of time into it. What I always find when I watch those academics... You put them then in front of a group of first-year bachelor students talking about something, about their area of research. And those first-year students, they'll do one of two things. They'll walk out looking completely crushed because there's been such an information dump, their brains are completely overloaded. Or they'll walk out looking lost because they lost a thread halfway through. If you're lucky, it was halfway. Sometimes they've lost it in the first five minutes of a two and a half hour lecture. And they won't ever get it back. And I used to have the joy of watching that. And thinking, okay, we're going to have to go back over this. Now you could put the same lecture in front of a load of master students who've spent already three years exposed to the topic, uh, doing their bachelors, and now in their fourth year, and they will keep up with it. They will have enough knowledge, enough of a reading, enough of entry into that world, that they'll be able to keep up with it. Because it's not so much that you're speaking over people's heads, or you're being super smart and they're not they're dumb or anything like that it's that you're in a world where you know the language intimately of that world you know the lexicon you know the phraseology completely backwards forwards sideways all the all the places and it's drilled into you it's part of who you are and the trouble is you then start speaking as you hear it in your head. And you hear it in your head as it's developed over, let's say, 10, 20 years of research. When I'm talking about naval aviation, when I'm talking about this, I first started visiting the National Archives and looking into developments of British aircraft carriers when I was 16 years old. That's 20 years for me, nearly 21 this year. And so I worry when I start doing this because I've seen what happens with historians who've been doing topics for 20, 30 years and I see how they are when they're dealing with first year students. And I always aim these videos to an extent as I would giving a lecture to a first year student. And I never want to set up a video 
whereby you have to go and watch other videos to know what I'm talking about. I don't mind referring for extra information and extra context, or if you want to go more, learn more, please go to this video. But every video, the aim is always that if you just watch that video, it's standalone. You will have enough information to follow the argument, to follow the discussion, and go away and draw your own conclusions, as well as hopefully understanding why I've reached the ones I have. That's always the aim. But I have to say, as I was looking at the year of the aircraft carrier, which is this year, and the videos for this year, I was worried. I am worried. Mo most people forget when I'm talking about travels, battles, and darings. This was not my PhD thesis. My PhD start thesis started out as the strategic, political, technological, and operational reasons behind the development of naval aviation 1918 to 1939. It started out looking at American, British, and Japanese. It grew so large, it ended up being just about the Royal Navy. <laughs> I still had the sections for the Japanese and the Americans, though. I wrote them up. It's just the PhD thesis was limited to 100,000 words, give or take 10%. And I had somewhere in the region of 200,000 words written. And the quickest and easiest way to get it down to 110,000 words was to take out the sections about the American and the Japanese navies. And that's what I did. And that was before, that was that word count before including Annex. I hadn't noticed the word count had gone up that much because whilst I kept it structured, I'd done everything in their own independent word files for each chapter. And each section was divided into three chapters. And it was only when I got to the end of my target did I add them all up and go, oh, I went over the word count. No, well, I can either start cutting whole sections and making these bits all look disjointed and try and cover everything, or I can cut down the ground I'm covering. And the advice from my advisor, Andrew Lambert, was to cut down the ground I was covering. So I did. But one of the other sections which was taken out was the whole thing about the development of the escort forces in the various navies for their aircraft carriers in terms of how, what they were looking at as escorting those carriers. And that, in the Royal Navy's term, was the genesis of my work and research into tribals, battles, and darings. It's not my PhD thesis. It's a section of it. Very small section of that. Literally, we're talking 10,000 words from the original document. And I'd actually taken these off before I took the Americans and the Japanese. I took the escort forces out before I took the Americans and the Japanese out. And that would have probably added about another 60-odd 60, 60 thousand words to the, the whole thing. It was big. It was the culmination of... Well... It was the culmination of nearly 10 years of study, I think, at that point. S eight years of archival study. And it was, it, it was everything I put my effort into for... Well, for pretty much those 10 years, because when I was 11, I was diagnosed as dyslexic. This is not simply a point, this is background. And I was told by one of my teachers that I would never accomplish anything, I would never go to university, and I would never be able to do anything with my life. Now, normally at this point, some people go, well, perhaps he was, perhaps that tutor was reverse psychologizing you, you know, motivating you and making you stubborn so that you would go. No, he wasn't. There are some people who do that, and I, I do admit there are some people. But he wasn't. 
that wasn't his way. But I did have fun when I went back to that school with my PhD. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I was that petty. He didn't like it. But what am I saying here? I'm saying that I'm hoping that I will deliver videos which will both contain the right level of information for you all, enough to interest you, intrigue you, help you further your own learning, should you so wish. And hopefully I won't slip into that academic trap of your area of specialism and produce videos which are about as um, penetrable <laughs> uh, as a lead line concrete steel reinforced concrete box. Um, yeah. Fun times. So, naval aviation begins. In 1908, with the order of HMS HMA Mayfly, and yes, the Royal Navy really did order, call their first airship the Mayfly. Here is the thing: Zeppelin in Germany had, of course, been developing rigid airships, and these were intriguing as reconnaissance assets. And of course, the German army had bought some. Brenda Milley decides it's going to respond. How will it respond? The Royal Navy buys one. <laughs> Why? Because the army's going, Why would we want one? What use is it for us? The Royal Navy's going, Reconnaissance! Even better, Recognizance! Because the Royal Navy has two te firms around at this time. This is the joy of the English language. Reconnaissance is the modern phraseology we all know about, but and we all sort of follow them, but I often... You might hear on my channel talk about recognizance, and I even write it in my books. Why? Because reconnaissance was believed, considered by the Royal Navy, to believe you reckon you had you under what the opponent was. You believe you reckon you reckon, so you're not really sure. Recognizance was you recognize what the enemy is. So basically, your reconnaissance screen might signal. They, they've reconned, the enemy has X number of cruisers. They've recogged, the enemy has three cruisers. And the commander would know from that phraseology what the difference was. They definitely have three cruisers. They probably have, versus they probably have three cruisers. And these are what they are, is usually what it, we've recogged they have three cruisers and these are their names. Da -da 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 -da. It was hoped, and yes I do have a screwdriver in my hand, uh, it was hoped that with the Mayfly and other assets like her, they would be able to do a lot more recognizance of German movements. Very quickly, they do come upon some issues with them, but it works, broadly speaking. It's sensible, broadly speaking, and it helps them. And it becomes the modus operandi for pretty much all the developments of naval aviation from this point till about 1914. They are motivated by reconnaissance, to use the overarching term, or spotting. Either they are finding the enemy, or they are calling the full shot. And that's not a bad thing. And at this point, aircraft are not really great. It's one of those interesting things when people sort of start talking about development of naval aviation, especially once you get to the 1920s. The amount of people who will turn around and tell you that, well, the, it was known that the, the battleship was over and the, the age of the aircraft was coming. It wasn't. It's kind of like lasers today. And you know, other things with in terms of energy saving systems, etc. They they we know they're coming. We know they're gonna be here at some point. 
but we're not sure if it's going to be next year, next decade, or next century. They're coming, but we need to do a few bit of development first, and things keep turning out not as quite as we're predicting them to. Maybe it's, pro maybe it's problems with the technology as we understand it. Maybe it's we're not applying it right. Or maybe it's because we're barking up the completely wrong tree in how to actually develop it. We don't know. But we're trying. It's the same with aircraft. <laughs> it is really the same aircraft. They're sitting there going, Yeah, hey, good. What can they do? Well, we think they can do this. Okay. Prove it. Okay. And it's proving it, and it's developing it. And one of the things you're going to be really find interesting, I hope, in this video, is we're going to talk about a lot of things that were proved in World War One that were proven. Mayfly? Well, apart from having the most appropriate name ever given to an aircraft, you know, literally, the first aircraft. Will it fly? It may fly. What's his name going to be? May fly. Not sure which particular naming officiado came up with this name. Some people try and put it on Fisher. I don't think so. I don't think it was Fisher. If I had a bet, it would be Reginald Bacon. At that time, a captain. Mainly because it, from reading the books of both of them, and the writings of both of them, it's more Bacon's sense of humour. But, realistically, the genesis of naval aviation, it's all about information warfare. The Germans have Zeppelins. They have two. Soon they go up in the number and have a couple more, but so does the Royal Navy. How useful are two Zeppelins? How much of the North Sea can you really monitor with a couple of Zeppelins? Nothing. Nothing. You Think about this, because, you see, you launch them... They go up, they carry enough supplies and food and fuel for how many days? How fast can they really fly? If they're going into a... a how fast is the are the winds they're going to be going into? Will they be buffeted around by them? Will they have any control of where they're actually going? All these things are real problems for... Airships. They just... And I'm not even call, keen on calling them airships, to be honest. For rigid inflatables. Because the technology just hasn't got there yet. One of the interesting things is how these aircraft and this aircraft type will develop. And how capable they will get. And it's led to some interesting discussions on the channel in recent weeks over the idea of using airships during the... Battle Atlantic, if the Germans had used them for reconnaissance assets to try and direct their wolf packs in. Oh, maybe have one as a floating aircraft carrier. It's a nice idea. It wouldn't be able to carry that much aircraft and would probably become target numero uno for the Royal Navy's aircraft carriers to find and hunt down and destroy. But, yeah, it's an idea. Don't think it would work that well. Mainly because they're not actually as fast as moving as, well, some of the aircraft carriers would be sent after them. But more importantly, if it's staying in one place or coordinating its position, it's going to make giving up a lot of signals. And that's going to reveal their position, which with all the uh, direction finding stations the British have, is going to mean almost certainly death very quickly. And it's the same for the Germans in World War One. you know. To an extent, the British are sometimes are following their movements by listening for signals from their airships. Because there is no way for the airships to communicate with anyone else without you doing radio signals. Ships in movement can communicate by flashing signals at each other with their lights. Yay! 
or flag, signal flags. They can do all of that. But these things have to radio them, and they have to be responded to by radio. Then we have fixed wing aviation, and for once, I don't know how it happens, but the US Senate actually gets its fingers out of its... Mm, and I think it's honestly to do with Curtis. I, I think there is a fact that I, I, I think it's honestly C Curtis and his company and the sheer work of Glenn Curtis. Um, I just realized I've been calling him Curtis and I didn't mention he was Glenn. Glenn Hammond Curtis. He's an absolute amazing pioneer of American aviation. And he pretty much drives this in America. He gets the political support, he gets the Navy support. And this is why they have this, you know, they do the first takeoff from an air, uh, from a ship, stationary. And the first landing on a ship, stationary. USS Birmingham, USS Pennsylvania, 1910, 1911. And Eugene Eli it does both, is the pilot for both. Really good pilot. However... However, they got the first naval aviator. They got all sorts of things into them, but <sighs> it's getting it beyond this. It's getting it beyond this. At one point, actually, Italy is in the front. In roughly August 1911, they're almost certainly in the lead in some regards of funding an organization. And this is the other point I tried to make to people about the tech race going on, because we always get focused in on the naval race in terms of the construction of dreadnoughts between Britain and, uh, Britain and Germany. And that sort of race. But we forget that the tech race is going on, the, the qualitative race rather than the quantitative race. It's going on between Britain, America, Italy and Japan. And it's not just in terms of dreadnoughts. It's in terms of all sorts of areas of naval technology. In fact, the thing that's driving forward naval technology in, 19, in 1910s and even the 1900s is not the Anglo-German naval race by any stretch of the imagination. The Germans are happy to churn out clones of whatever the British are producing. Germanized versions of them. It's the Americans, it's the Italians, it's the Japanese who are pushing forward things and the British responding by trying to keep ahead of them, which then in turn forces the Germans to have to respond to the British. The Germans hate that. They run on a structured economy where they plan their finances out because they don't want to interfere with the army's funding. There is a reason the army gets Zeppelins, not the navy. They very much have the budget. But in this scenario, they keep getting dragged forward into more and more, ever more expensive things to try and keep up with the Royal Navy, which is trying to keep ahead of the Americans, the Japanese, and the Italians. So it's unsurprising that after this, Britain rapidly mobilizes. <laughs> they actually might be going to get ahead. Frigate, frigate, frigate. Um, actually, probably it was more like frigate, 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 cruiser. Frigate, 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 cruiser. Okay, so, 1912. They do the first flying off an aircraft with a ship moving. from the Hibernia. They've also done their first takeoff from a ship while at anchor in January 1912. And it's May 1912 when they take off from a ship moving. I will also add that the Americans had also tested the first catapult launch in August 1912 and in 1915 made the first capital launch from a ship underway. They have, there is this all sorts of research work going into it. And one of the really interesting what-ifs of naval history is 
people often ask me, is would aircraft carriers have come about even if it hadn't been for World War One? Yes. They were heading down that route. And the major reason they're heading down that route is because... Well, both Britain and America and Italy and Japan are running into the same problem. Trying to operate them from their regular ships, it just gets in the way. It's taking up the space of guns. It's taking up the space of maneuverability. So this is where Hermes first gets attached to the whole naval aviation game. You know, HMS Hermes, very traditional name in the Royal Navy for aircraft carriers. Ark Royal Hermes Pegasus. Three very traditional names. Very, very traditional names. They've come up multiple times. And what you sort of is a kind of an interesting scenario for Britain, Eagle is also another one which likes to come up a bit, a fair bit, is if you were going for naming ships after Queen Elizabeth and Prince of Wales, if there'd be more to that class, Ark Royal probably would have been the third. But if you start looking at the fourth, if you're going by tradition, you should probably be going back to Hermes again. Probably, for naval aviation terms. That's a traditional aircraft carrier name. I doubt they would. I think they would have gone with something else. But um, I think they'd have gone with something far more martial and capital ship-esque. So, from the uh, battleship names, a naming team rather than the carrier naming team. But still, after Ark Royal. Ark Royal they'd have gone with. But this is the point, really. These names become attached to naval aviation in this period. It's one of the beauties of naval aviation. In no other area is it quite so visible, the start of the Navy. The start of this thing in naval terms. We talk about torpedoes. Well, they come from mines which are originally called torpedoes. And those mines come from another type of mine. And you can go back several generations and it becomes... It's an interesting idea to work it through and work the whole thing along. In naval aviation, you can really point to a point and go, yeah, that's when it started. The idea of having high-flying reconnaissance, etc., that's slightly earlier. There's been balloon ships around for a while, and I'll be talking about the kite balloon ships in a second. But the f real f hard point of naval aviation, the development of naval aviation is something we can put down to and we can go, that's 20th century. Why? Because naval aviation as a flexible asset begins when aviation begins as a flexible asset. In fact, navies and are some of the first adopters because of the reconnaissance problem. If you think about that, which is more expensive to send over there to see what's over there? A cruiser or a little aircraft, which is a more expensive asset to deploy. And which is something you're more worried about risking? A cruiser or a little aircraft? Hundreds of crew, one crew. Valuable asset that can kill other things because it has guns. Thing that just flies and folds up. And that's why Hermes is actually used. This 1913, they have a full exercise. And they're going, right then, how are we going to deploy aircraft? Well, we're going to have to have a special ship. And they adapt her. And why adapt her? I mean, they remove guns. They erect a canvas hangar for a couple of aircraft. One aircraft they try out on deck to see what happens with Unsurprisingly, have a guess which aircraft wasn't really that operational after a couple of days. Anyone want to guess which aircraft didn't really work that well? No? Yeah, you'd be right. And so, you have all this idea, all these ideas going along. There's also constant debates about how to structure naval aviation. Again, 
in America, in Britain, all over the places, there is debates about how this is going to be employed. In Britain, they keep setting up an independent air, naval air service and then recombining with the army and then se uh, separating it again. The Royal Navy are separate. They've drawn their own uh, people from the Royal Aero Club, which is a whole interesting organization to get into, and it's a whole, whole video in of itself. And... Then they're reformed into, amalgamated into the Royal Flying Corps in 1912, because that's supposed to grow aviation more quickly. And then the Royal Flying Corps is divided off again, and the Royal Naval Air Service is born in 1914. It's you know, the history of naval aviation as being disparate and joint to land operations and land-based aviation is convoluted, to say the least. And furthermore, you must realize that before even World War One begins, the first naval aviation reconnaissance in terms of active operations has already been carried out. April 1914, 24th of April 1914, and continuing for... Uh, there is arguments about this. Believe it or not, there are arguments about this. I usually put it down at roughly 49 days. Roughly 7 weeks. But some go 45 days. And some go more. So I, I will say roughly 7 weeks. Five float planes and flying boats are flown from Mississippi and Birmingham off Veracruz and Veracruz and Tampacchio, Mexico, for the Tampacchio affair. They're providing reconnaissance. They're telling the U.S. Navy what's going on in Mexico, and that's before war has even begun. Now, then we have kite balloon ships and. Okay, for starters, before I get into them too much, this is called HMS Manica. I've been looking for a decent picture from her, and I kept getting redirected to something called HMS Monica on the Australian War Memorial site. And I went, there's never been an HMS Monica. I've looked in multiple books. In multiple books. I mean, this book specifically. It's probably the best one to look for. It's the Ships of the Royal Navy. It's a complete guide and it's multiple editions in and they've been keep doing a fairly good job of keeping up. And there is not a single HMS Monica in here. And in this period, even the HMAS would be covered, included in the Royal Navy. So I think it's HMS Manica, which is named for a region in Mozambique, I think from memory, and was originally a merchant ship. So... I've used it for to illustrate HMS Manica. So. I think I'm probably right. I think, and I have this theory, that someone saw the name and thought, oh, it must be Monica. What's Manica? In the world, in the, uh, the era before Google, when you couldn't Google it, and thought, I'm not, I don't want to put this smelling mistake in. I don't want to upset this photographer. I'm just going to correct it. That's my sneaking suspicion, but I could be wrong. But yes, kite balloon ships. Well, again, it's about the reconnaissance thing, and it's about sticking something up there so you can see what's going on. And basically, the entire problem that they have is wireless communication sets, radio sets, they are slowly becoming lighter, slowly becoming more practical, and slowly becoming more reliable, but not necessarily fast enough for the people on the surface to feel the benefit of them. In fact, that's the argument often used about aircraft at Jutland. The fact is they just the communications weren't getting through. And it's honest argument. Maybe try launching more aircraft, but if the aircraft up there aren't working, what hope do you have that the aircraft that you could launch might uh, might work? You don't know. So it's it's an issue. What I would say 
with kite balloon ships was the idea was that they could, you know, have a tether system. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. For communications. They could be floated up, flow up, and watch and send down signals and broadcast them out about the fullest shot and spot what the enemy were doing. It's great, and this is her at Gallipoli. And she was involved in other operations as well. It's all about trying to look over the next hill, but also trying to watch the entire surface of the sea. How do I put this politely? This is the point at which flat earthers tend to lose me. And tend to find me upsetting, because... This whole problem comes back to the fact the Earth isn't flat. There's a curvature in the Earth, and you can't see round the bend. You also cannot see round the Earth. So, if you can get higher up, you can see further. Higher up you get, the further you can see. To an extent, okay? So, this is why... The crow's nest was so important on sailing ships. Because it was the highest point on the ship and would allow them to look around the furthest. And if you had a really good set of eyes up there and they were watching out, they could see and figure out the enemy a long way away. And in the age of sail, you had that gave you a lot of time because of the speed of engagement and you know, the likely speed of you getting close to, get to each other. Well, as ships sped up, and became less and less dependent upon the wind. That time of engagement shrank down. And we were always looking, humanity was always looking as a whole, let alone the individual navies, humanity as a whole was always looking a way to increase that engagement time again. To increase your ability to see beyond you. Because... That range of visual identification, that range of knowing where the enemy was, was life. If you knew where they were before they knew where you were, you could decide whether you engaged or not. You could decide whether they're powerful enough that you can win the fight, or powerful enough you should avoid the fight. And again, this is what naval aviation is about in this period. It really is about this. But we have a timeline of firsts still. We do have some firsts. And it's worthwhile considering them. We have the first aerial torpedo dropped in trials by a short folder flown by Lieutenant, later Air Chief Marshal, Arthur Longmore in 1914. So if we go back to this, you will see the short folder is that aircraft at the top there. Yeah, they had dropped a torpedo from that. If you would also not honestly be volunteering to fly that plane, don't worry, neither would I. I know my limits of my own bravery, and getting into that is beyond them. The first purpose-built seaplane carrier, HMS Ark Royal, built in 1914, pictured there. That is the height of technology, and pretty much was a starting point for my PhD thesis, I must admit, because the whole idea was, what I was going through, was that, you know, you have the relationship between the engineers, and the relationship between the aircraft and the ships, and that the aircraft can't develop if the ships don't develop, and the ships can't develop if the aircraft don't develop, and you need both, and you need them developing together, and... That's how you can start to see the true operational strategic aims of the different nations developing naval aviation by looking at how their ships and their aircraft are orientated. This is where I get the whole point about talking about the Americans and the Japanese being orientated around the big punch. They can do the, but they're orientated around delivering that as best as they can. So it makes them slightly less efficient than doing this. Whereas the British carriers are orientated around doing this, which makes them slightly less efficient at doing that. Because that's not... They can do it. They can all do it. 
but it's not what their design is oriented around in terms of their shops and their the fit. Well, when I call about shops, I'm talking about the workshops and the fitting stations they have, and how they outfit and how they operate and generate their aircraft and their airflows. They can do it, but it's not what they're orientated around. And again, the first Berbers built seaplane carrier tells you a lot about what seaplanes and what they are thinking about in terms of operating of these aircraft. And the sheer size and positioning of those cranes shows you what's really important for them. First strike from a seaplane carrier on land targets, Singtao, hit by Japanese Navy from the Wakayama in September 1914. Literally, the first strike carried out by naval aircraft is done by the Japanese in September 1914. Think about that the next time someone turns around to you and goes, you know what, the Japanese learned all their naval aviation from copying XYZ or from this, that, the other. They literally carried out the first strike. So technically, technically, it could be argued we all copied them. HMS Engadine, Riviera and Empress had to wait till December 1914 to attack Cuxhaven. It wasn't as successful in actual results, considering the number of aircraft involved, but it was much more grando successful in terms of um, German morale. And frigate, they can actually do that? It was good. And in August 1915... A short Type 184, which was a development of the um, folder, flown by Flight Commander Charles Edmonds from the seaplane carrier HMS Ben Maishari. Yes, Ben Maishari. It's a real ship. It has lots of lessons for naval hi naval history and naval development. And frankly, the it's experience on that which really do shape Royal Navy carrier development. Ben Maishari is just massively important to development of the aircraft carrier design for the Royal Navy. Sunk an Ottoman supply ship in the Sea of Marmara with a 14-inch, that's 360mm at the time, 810-pound, or 370kg, torpedo. So yes, the first ship to be sunk by aerial torpedo was August 1915. You can sink ships by two ways. You can start a fire that they can't put out, or you can make a hole which will let enough water in that they can't uh, they can't stay afloat. When I'm asked by students why torpedo bombers are so emphasized in terms of naval aviation right up until into World War Two, I point to this. It's quite simple. When you're talking about proven weapon systems, that's what for armed forces tend to develop in. They are tend to be very conservative. Very, very conservative. With a small C, but very conservative in terms of how they spend their money. They want to go for something which they're sure is going to work. They know torpedo bombers will work. They've sunk ships. It's also the other reason why... The whole, well, we sunk it with bombs by certain people. Okay. Sinking the Ostfriesland, for example, by Billy Mitchell. It doesn't help. Aircrafts have already sunk ships by this point. They've done it this way. That wasn't the point. That was against a merchant vessel, which didn't have good damage control. They were, the whole point about the Ostfriedland and its being attacked, and it's post World War One, and the whole point for it being attacked was so they could study the damage done to it, not sink it. They wanted to look and grade the damage done by the bombs being dropped in realistic conditions, and they were trying to adjust for the fact it didn't have a crew on it doing damage control, it didn't have AA firing back, etc., by setting up certain other conditions for the test. 
and then Mitchell ignores them to show that aircraft can sink battleships. Doesn't help the US Navy, doesn't help anyone. Get some papers, get some headlines in newspapers, but that's mainly because newspapers are always looking for headlines to sell newspapers. There's nothing wrong with that. They often have lots of interesting information in, but they're always trying to sell newspapers. That's how they keep their business going. But headlines don't help you make decisions in wartime. If we consider taking this up to the modern example, currently there's all sorts of discussions going on about strikes in the Middle East to deal with the current um, issues with Houthis attacking people, in the, attacking ships and shipping in the Red Sea. There's also discussions about why isn't an aircraft carrier being sent by the Royal Navy. Well, we have land bases for an aircraft very close to there, and we have land-based aircraft already there. Why deploy an aircraft carrier as well? We have other missions the aircraft carriers can be doing. The whole only reason you'd be deploying an aircraft carrier is so you have the headline you're deploying an aircraft carrier. Will that help? Will that, on its own, stop the Houthis doing what they're doing? Probably not. So there's no point to it. It's better to use that aircraft carrier for other missions. That's going off on topic, but it is it's worthwhile thinking about when we're talking about naval aviation. It's firsts. If you start looking through this... And you start thinking through all these things. A lot of these firsts are driven by competition. In the case of the British, it's because the Americans have been jumping ahead. And the Italians are looking like they're going to jump ahead next, so the British have to dash in. And the British dash in, arguably, before they're ready. Because they haven't had a Curtis pushing stuff forward and helping stuff out. Instead, they've gone off down the whole airship track. It happens. And naval aviation is developing rapidly. Mostly for the reconnaissance purposes. But also... The fact is, the first aerial torpedo is dropped. That's it was being planned and worked on from about 1913 onwards. Why? Because the torpedo is the best weapon for making a hole in the hull of a ship to let water in and sink them. And if an aircraft can carry a torpedo, that's useful. That's something which is definitely going to sink a ship. A bomb might hit a point that might start a fire which might sink the ship. But a torpedo hitting you know, quite large areas of ships will sink them. That's a matter of whether it's fired by a submarine, torpedo boat, torpedo boat destroyer, or aircraft. Or any other thing. A torpedo will do the damage. If it hits. So. That was the beginnings of naval aviation. It starts off with reconnaissance. It builds based on reconnaissance. Starts to grow an attack plan based on torpedoes. Eventually. They include guns and start looking at being fighter aircraft. About the same time that World War One has it occur on land. About the same time they start fitting guns onto aircraft over the Western Front, they start thinking, hang on, these might be useful on our aircraft, on our seaplanes. Oh, let's fit them. So, what have we got coming with the year of the aircraft carrier? Well, the beginning of the naval aviation is how we're beginning. And then it's the first next week in the series of the conception, operation, and conclusion of... And here's today's big announcement and also question. I've put out 22 of those. 
You'll notice usually I have five which are viewer suggestions in a year, and I haven't put any of those up there this year because I'm doing it slightly different. There are a lot of aircraft carriers. There are a lot of ships which are aircraft carriers, and I don't. I want to be able to do a key ships about them as well at some point from the technology perspective, and keep up the key ship series. But conception, operation, and conclusion. So looking at their service lives and going into what they did, that can be interesting. But for that, I'd like to have your suggestions. I'm not asking you to suggest 22. If you can suggest 22 ships you'd like to hear me talk about individually, I'm happy to take those 22 suggestions on board. But if you just want to suggest a dozen, if you just have a few you'd like me to talk about, I will go through them all. My plan is to look and see what I suggested match it up with what I have in stock book-wise, what I can get in stock book-wise, what I can do in terms of archival research, and from next Monday have a list of all of the, uh, these one, these uh, completed with names inserted to instead of those numbers. So this is only for this week, this is a slide, hopefully. Hopefully, by next week, I have ships there and there. you also notice that I have put in some squadron details. Now, one of the things I very quickly found out was that the British are kind of weird. We keep our squadrons going, and we bring them back, and they end up getting squadron histories. Whereas other navies are all slightly different, and have their own slightly methodology in terms of naval aviation. So I decided to do videos about that instead. So I thought, well, the British, because they're weird and because I've done time with some of those squadrons, I'm going to pick out individual squadrons and talk about them. And so there are six of those squadrons picked out. But there's also USN aircraft squadron systems, the uh, French naval aircraft squadron system, the Imperial Japanese naval aircraft squadron system, the uh, land-based naval aviation has been put in there because, well, it seemed to be sensible at some point to talk about it, so I added it into August. Um, then we've got the Soviet naval aviation system. We've got those five videos I normally do, which are viewers' suggestions, uh, have been said to be turned into British World War II carrier naval aviation doctrine pre war, to war. American World War II carrying naval aviation doctrine, pre-war, to war. Japanese World War II carrying naval aviation doctrine, pre-war, to war. And French and other nations World War II carrying naval aviation doctrine, pre-war, to war. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm also going to do some videos which are going to be sort of generic era covers, so... Pre-World War One carriers, looking at the ships which were coming about and being developed by the various navies prior to World War One. So I'll be talking more about HMS Hermes, and I'll be talking about USS Birmingham and USS Pennsylvania and other ships. Ne well, in February. Then I'm going to go with the age of seaplane carrier. So expect me to cover Ben My Cherie and others that in that period. But if Ben My Cherie has been suggested as an individual ship, I'm sure I can do justice to that as well. I'm not adding any hints about Ben My Shuri at all, am I? I'm not I'm not at all suggesting Ben My Shuri. It's not because it's one of my favourite names in Royal Navy history to talk about and pronounce. <laughs> ben My Shuri. Leaving that to one side. Then it's the first carriers and conversions and scratch builds for the 2nd of April. Treaty carriers for the 7th of May. Carriers of the War Fleet for the 4th of June. War Emergency Ships for the 2nd of July. War Experience Carriers for the 6th of August. Super Carriers and Specialists for September, 3rd of September. War is over. War has just begun. The current carrier generation, 1st of October. And Never Built Carriers, November the 5th. I hope you're going to enjoy this year, as much as I'm hoping to enjoy it. 
I've tried to structure it in a way that it should, should work. But we'll see. Thank you very much for watching, and I will look forward to seeing all your suggestions of carriers you'd like me to cover. As I said, there are 22 slots. My thing is, I was originally going to do uh, thinking about how to do it in terms of the cruiser year, where I did a different cruiser each week. Or cl class of cruiser. And I quickly realised that with aircraft carriers, it was going to be more complicated. As you have to add in a lot more details. And because also they're almost more fluid than cruisers, they tend to have more variations, more developments in their terms of their design. And so it made sense to do it this way. To be able to put things in context and give them the nuance which I try to add into my channel. Anyway, thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Take care.